Oh, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I don't speak Turkish. I apologize in advance for that, but um, I can say that it's it's just an absolute pleasure to be here among all of you, and, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy lives to come and spend this, uh, what I hope will be a remarkable day together. So, and uh, also, I too want to thank everyone from the Office of um, International Affairs? No. Programs. Programs, the Office of International Programs. I can tell you that everyone has been so attentive to every last detail, making all of us who are here from, from away comfortable and going, just everyone going to extraordinary measures to make us uh, feel welcome. So I want to thank, thank everyone for that. So why dignity? People ask me this all the time. Donna, why, why dignity and, and what role does it have to play in conflict? And I can tell you that for the last 20 years, I've been, I've been convening dialogues all over the world, really. Actually, I never did work with the, um, the Cypriot uh, people or uh, in Turkey before. I've never done any dialogues with Greeks and Turks. But I can tell you that I've, I've been in the Middle East. I worked for many, many years on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Many years in Sri Lanka on the conflict there. Um, in South America with the Colombia conflict. I've done dialogues with identity groups in, uh, with the US and Cuba. And uh, no matter where I was in the world, sitting at these tables, with, by the way, with some of the most brilliant leaders in the communities um, that were sitting at the table trying to resolve their differences. Brilliant, brilliant people. Because we always worked with the top level leadership. And even though it seemed so clear that there had to be a way out of these conflicts, that we had the best and the brightest struggling to try to, to make some headway and re achieve some kind of resolution. Even though all of that was set in place, there was still something, there was still something that prevented people, these bright, capable people, and, and profoundly dedicated people, still something that prevented them from being able to put this past to rest. And after many, many sessions, and again, it was everywhere in the world, I started listening very carefully, because I'm a psychologist, I was trained as a psychologist, and I started listening to the conversations that were taking place about how to resolve the political issues. Because that's what we were, we were always working on. How are we going to settle the problem with territory? How are we going to settle the problem with um, refugees? There was always the political and objective issues that were on the table trying desperately to be worked through. And but as I said, because I was a psychologist, I was tuning into another dimension, another conversation that was taking place, what I call, under the table. A very powerful current was flowing under these tables, these negotiating tables. And I, I can tell you the emotional content of, the, of that current was very, very powerful. And I realized that this conversation that was taking place that had such profound emotional impact. They were asking themselves questions like, how dare you treat me this way? Don't you see I'm a human being? And when you treat me like I'm a second class citizen or when you treat me badly, don't you know I hurt? Don't you know it's painful for me to sit here and take this kind of treatment? And it's going back and forth. It wasn't just one side to the other. And you know, this is my interpretation, of course. And then I realized, oh my gosh, we have to figure out a way to bring this emotional conversation up to the table and discuss it. Because in my view, it, was, it were these unresolved emotional issues that were fueling these conflicts and making it very difficult for people who had the best and the brightest ideas to sign on to an agreement. And I remember one day thinking, okay, this is an emotional issue. Sure, how am I going to get these very powerful men, because they were always men at the table, how am I going to get these very powerful men to talk about this emotional stuff? I said, forget it, it's not going to. Can you imagine if I said to them, 
All right, explain to me and tell me about a time when you felt you were emotionally injured by the other side. Well, guess how many hands would go up? Guess how many? Zero. And one day I'm sitting there and I said to myself, wait a minute, I know what this is about. I had this epiphany, you know, it was like this big flash of enlightenment. And I realized, this is about people's dignity. This is about, you know, as I said earlier, how dare you treat me this way? And when I had this brilliant, I mean, for me it was brilliant, right? For my own personal um, understanding. I thought, this is the language that we can use to talk about these other issues that are underlying, that have so much power behind them. And so I started thinking, well, and I started experimenting more than thinking. I started asking people, tell me a time when you feel that your dignity was violated by the other side. Well, guess how many hands went up then? Everybody in the room had a story. Every, everybody had more than one story. Everybody had a whole set of volumes of stories about how they felt their dignity had been violated. So you can imagine, I mean, I was, I was ecstatic when I realized we have an opportunity here. If we can frame these discussions, if we can help people um, get to the point where they feel comfortable talking about this other level, this more psychological level, this more deeply, profoundly human level, not politics, but it's the human level that I felt needed to be addressed. So renaming these experiences uh, violations to our dignity, it had an extraordinary effect because not only were people willing to talk about it, but there was almost this sense of validating themselves, that they didn't feel humiliated anymore. It wasn't a humiliating act to admit that you had had your dignity violated. It was humiliating to say you'd been shamed or mis... You know. So it was, it was um, a turning point in my career, an absolute turning point in my career. And I decided, this was maybe 10 years ago, and I decided that as powerful as the workshops were that um, Professor Kelman, my mentor, um, did, and Maria Hajipablo and I were both trained by him, as powerful as those workshops were and transformative, I felt that getting, being able to un, unravel all of the, the ways, the profound ways that people felt, um, people felt violated would add another dimension to their ability to resolve their issues. So, um, let me just say, I'm going to flip this. So why dignity? Um, number one, I think what I identified, and many of my colleagues and students have helped with this. I mean, I'm not alone in this process, but it helps identify a source of universal suffering. And as I said, I was everywhere in the world. It wasn't just about Israelis and Palestinians. It wasn't just about Cubans and Americans. It wasn't just about Sri Lankans. It was about every human being. It was all of us that when we feel that we be, are mistreated, I believe there's a universal yearning to be treated with dignity. And I, I do this course that I'm about to do in the next couple of days with, with people, students, people from all over the world, and there hasn't been one situation where somebody has said, oh, dignity is not important to me. Dignity is not part of my culture. It is this resonance that human beings feel. And so I decided, when I decided to write my book, that I'm going to look not at the level of our individual identities. I, I decided I'm going to focus my research on what it means to be a human being at the level of our human species. All right? So it's the level that can basically bring us all together. And not only, so what it means then is not only is it a source of is dignity a source of universal suffering? But the flip side of it is, if we can figure out how to restore dignity again, if we can figure out how to make people feel that their dignity is intact, and to recognize, furthermore, that my dignity is no different from any of yours. 
Dignity is what equalizes the playing field, all right? We may have different, be different in status, you know, we have the president of the, and we have a hierarchical structure in our social systems, most of us. And that gives us more or less power. But when it comes to dignity, everybody has the same. Every single person has the same amount of dignity. And so, what does that mean? It gives us this tremendous potential, this tremendous possibility of creating a transcendent identity where these political identities and the national identities and the divisions that keep us so, you know, so apart, if we can transcend that just for, the, for, a, for a moment and recognize that we're all connected at this level, that we're all human beings, we have the same reactions to things, we have the same reactions to when, when we're violated, we have the same reactions to when someone honors our dignity. We feel wonderful when someone honors our dignity. So what is dignity, you might ask? I'm very curious. Would ever, anyone just, anybody, just tell me what comes to mind when you think of the word dignity? <laughs> Honor, yeah. Self-respect, Self yes. Anything else? Yes, up there? Uh, how you want others to see you. How others see you? How, how, you, how, you, would like how you would like others to see you, definitely. Anybody else? Can't see very well. Yes. Dual recognition of the uh, inherent value of person. Beautiful. The dual recognition of the inherent self, value, self and other, and the ones that how they see you. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, after all the research that I did, and you, you might be surprised to learn this. It was shocking to me when I started doing my research for my book. My book is called Dignity: The Essential Role It Plays in Resolving Conflict. When I did my research, there was nothing, zero, nothing written about dignity. I basically broke ground. And so the hard part about that was I had to start from scratch, right? I had to build my own theoretical base. I had to um, do, I had to create all of the concrete ways that we think about dignity that I'm going to show you in just a minute. But at the end of the day, let me tell you this, that dignity is a very simple concept. <laughs> Very simple. And I defined it as our inherent value and worth. Simply. It's our inborn inherent value and worth as human beings. And furthermore, after I started thinking about this, I realized, wait a minute, wait a minute. Human beings aren't just valuable. We are invaluable. We are priceless. And we are irreplaceable. So how do you treat something that is invaluable, priceless, and irreplaceable? 